Today's scripture comes from Colossians 3, 17. Whatever you do, whether in speech or action, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, and give thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, church, and welcome to those online. Hello to you as well, and uh, it is good to be back. And we didn't, you didn't know this, but this is the second part of a two-part sermon series. Last week was the first. Congratulations, you missed it. So it was the best sermon I ever preached, but uh, you didn't get to it. But basically, in a nutshell, was all about resolutions and the idea that, of course, it's a new year, we make resolutions, let's make some for God, was kind of the general idea in a nutshell of that sermon. There, you had it. Best sermon, shortest sermon you ever heard, voila. Onto this one, right? But I wanted to follow that up with this idea. Not only do we want to continue to strive and become more like Jesus Christ, but furthermore, we want to continue to do it and do it well. Let us pray together. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, the title of this sermon is called Upping Your Game. And of course, as we read in that scripture that just happened, it talked about that in every way of your life, in everything you do, give glory to God, right? And do it through Jesus Christ with thanksgiving. And as we are thinking about upping your game, something happened this week that I didn't even know was going on until uh, Friday uh, when I kind of came back from the land of the dead into the living this week. And so uh, Friday, I went over, got some medicine and, uh, over at Kroger. And it uh, happened to be about like right before 3 o'clock and turned on the radio station and put on the, the sports news because, of course, there's a big game tomorrow. I wanted to hear if they were going to talk about it at all. And, uh, you know, and so I might have worn the tie today. And uh, anyway, so uh, but was listening to it. And little did I know, but one of the, the probably the best actual sports radio show that I like as far as what's in Columbus is was a little one called. Uh, Bishop and Laurinaitis. I don't know if you guys ever listened to sports radio, but uh, Bo Bishop is a, was a, uh, basically, you know, any, any like sports newscaster kind of guy that did a bunch of reporting and all that stuff. Very, very good and very well spoken. Says a lot of good things. And then, of course, James Laurinaitis, you guys probably heard of him around here, but famous football player uh, for Ohio State, linebacker of very good proportions, won a lot of different awards while playing at Ohio State, went, of course, on to the NFL, had some great career, uh, a very, very solid career. And then you know, he was entering into the news radio uh, kind of outlet of that. And of course, he was wanting to do announcing and different things like that. Well, he got offered a job that was too good to pass up. His best friend is now the coach over at uh, Notre Dame or one of the coaches there. And so he was offered a position to come and be with them and help recruiting and do different things and be on the football field with kids again and stuff like that. And so it was his last show. And uh, didn't even know this until I started listening to it, but it was the end of the show. And at the end of the show, they always do three things. And so the, the two, Bo Bishop and James Laurinaitis and even their kind of producer guy, they all have three things that they go through and they talk about. And they did a three things on James Laurinaitis. And so I got to hear this right as I'm on the drive, like going away. And I was like, Wait, I don't even know where this guy's going. So I had to look it up later and all that stuff. But I heard this was his last show. And it was so telling because they started talking about James Laurinaitis and what was amazing about that is they started talking about the man that he is, and especially the two other people that did their three things, and they were sharing about things about James that they appreciated and they loved, which, if you ever listen to sports news radio, is not what is on sports news radio, right? It's all smack talk, it's all ripping people down, it's all talking about this person's better than this person, and all these different things is the whole premise of what happens in sports radio. And yet, for a good like 10, five, you know, five to 10 minutes, there was just this accolade of talking about this person as a person and the goodness of who they were. And what was said over and over again in that was, hey, you know, sometimes you get to meet your heroes and you don't want to because it kind of ruins your experience when you meet who they really are. And they talked about how James Laurinaitis was the opposite of that. It was when you met him, he was just such a great guy. And even the producer that was on that, you know, it's just a producer guy and not too famous or anything like that. But he talked about how uh, James and his wife came to his wedding you know, never thought he'd have time in his schedule at all, but they actually took time off from all the other responsibilities he had of all his newscasting and all that stuff and came to his wedding and how much that meant to him. And it was really telling because they were going on and talking about how great he was. But one of the things Bill Bishop mentioned about him was this. He said, you know what? One of the things I love about you is that you work to improve every aspect of your life. 
not just on the football field, but as a dad, as a, as a you know, just a person, as a, you know, and, and in your physical life, in your marriage, and every single thing, you work. And it's truly remarkable because you're always working and wanting to improve every single day, and it shows. It, it really was telling because that truly is kind of like his character if you ever get to hear him on the show and things like that. Or I guess now you got to go look up the old shows because now he's gone. But it was really telling about that, about how he worked and always wanted to improve and move forward. And so that's why this sermon is called Upping Your Game because in that same way, we as Christians are not called to pursuit of happiness, but pursuit of holiness. Again, not pursuit of happiness per se, but pursuit of holiness. And in some ways, we're always striving to improve every aspect of our life. We're always trying to be something more remarkable than we were the day before, not by our own, own doing or anything like that, but by God's Spirit working inside us, changing our hearts, transforming us into be, being more like Jesus Christ. One of the things that I love to always look at was resolutions, right? And last week, hopefully, maybe made some resolutions, maybe you didn't. Never too late because it's all, you know, January 1st is just a date on the calendar, right? You can always make something else you want to change or work on or do something with. And in fact, God calls us to constantly look at our lives and think about how we can allow God to change us and transform us. <coughs> One of the most famous passages in Scripture is the Shema, Deuteronomy chapter 6, which says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. When Jesus tells it in Matthew, he actually changes one word. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. And Mark and Luke, they actually add all four instead of choosing between the three of them. They actually say, hey, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your, stroll, all, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. And I wanted to look at this as, as kind of a way of, you know, God calls us in that verse to love God with everything we are. And, and it's kind of not really appropriate to divvy up this verse like we're about to do, but we're going to do it anyways. But if you really think about the meaning of that verse, it's really, you're supposed to offer God every single part of who you are. But for the sake of helping us come along in the journey and become a little more like Jesus Christ, I thought it'd be worthy to stop for a minute and to think, what are some ways that we can become more, better at loving the Lord our God with our heart, loving the goal, love our Lord our God with our soul, with our mind, and our strength. First one I wanted to mention here today is loving the God with your heart. Now, of course, when we encounter God and become more like God-like, there are certain ways that have been proven time and time and time again that we need to pursue. We need to pursue Bible study and reading their scripture and being immersed in the word. We need to be in prayer and, and prayer not only with the, or by ourselves and alone, but also in corporate prayer with each other, praying for all the needs of the world and for the church and for ourselves and for the world. We need to have times where we come and, you know, be with each other and worship. There's all sorts of things that God uses in our heart, or <coughs> uses in our life, that is. But when we think about loving the Lord our God with our heart, here's one of the things that heart, of course, means. And we've talked about this many times, but heart doesn't mean the emotional part of who we are for biblical authors. When they wrote heart, they meant basically this idea of steadfastness, of determination, of heart as in like when you're in a game, you know, a football game or whatever sporting game and you don't give up even though the score is whatever it is and you find a way to fight back because you just don't give up. It's that hard work, that hard determination, that willingness to keep going. Even when things are stacked against you, that is what heart is. And so how do we love the Lord our God with a little bit more heart than we did this year before? And what I would ask of you is Probably my least favorite thing in life is the word discipline. Does that, uh, no? Okay, you guys are like, some of you are like, oh, pastor. But yeah, but discipline, and I really mean that, is because one of the things that God uses in our life, and one of the ways that we show heart, is when we schedule our lives and show discipline. And the main way we do that is by whatever way we want to encounter God, whether it's a time of meditation, whether it's a time of prayer, maybe it's a time of scripture reading, maybe it's a prayer walk to get out in nature and just let nature just sink into us. Maybe it's a time to just sit and listen and actually listen to the words of a music that means something and draws our attention to God. But to do that and have a regular time and a regular moment of, of pieces of the day that you say, no, this is carved out for God and I'm going to let God do that. Now, if you don't have some type of rhythm in your life, uh, the, the Catholics of our faith, they, all, they call it the rule of life, if you will, of basically when you wake up in the day of having some type of schedule that you live out as if in some ways you're like a, a monk or a monastery and living in a monastery, that there are certain points of your day 
where worship is in your life is going to take place. And you carve it out. And if you miss it one day, guess what? You don't just throw up the towel and wave it. Get back to it the next day. And you keep going and you show discipline in your life. That's loving the Lord your God with all your heart. Now, the other one that John said, uh, that, that is said in there is loving your God with all your soul. Now, what is the difference, right? Now, again, in this verse, it's kind, of, it's kind of not right to pick it apart, per se, like we're doing. But nonetheless, it's good to think about a little bit. How do you love the Lord your God with your soul? Now, in our world and how we think about our world, we normally think of, you know, we have our mind and we have our body. But so many times we leave apart the soul as another piece of who we are. And in fact, so many ways in our culture, we basically deny the existence of the soul at all. But in truth, in Scripture, and it teaches us that we all have a soul. And we need to care for that soul. We need to nourish that soul. And the number one way we do that is through worship. I love the Psalms. And you can go and read any Psalm, pretty much, and go and find it. And somewhere in there, there's some part that it says something along the lines of, Oh, my soul, praise the Lord. And even some, some Psalms, they even go as far as to say, Wake up, my soul. Praise the Lord, right? Remember his goodness. Remember his things. And it's like you can see them actually speaking to their soul, which is quite an amazing kind of thing if you think about it. <clears throat> that it's not just about the heart, the strength, the body, the mind, but it's also this dynamic of our soul. And that sometimes our soul just needs direction. And it needs actually being guided, if you will. And that our soul can just almost be latent and just sitting there. And sometimes we have to actually direct it. And just like the Psalms do, as a great one to look up is Psalm 103, where it just talks about praising the Lord and praising the Lord is to wake up one's soul. One of the best ways I've found to do that, and maybe a challenge, and maybe you've never done this, is to, to start a prayer group with somebody. And um, one of the amazing things about prayer groups is they just open your eyes in so many ways that you never really noticed. Because... There's so many times you pray, and sometimes you don't know what to pray, or sometimes you, you just have said the same prayer over and over that your mind can wander, or things like that. But when you're praying with somebody, an amazing thing happens there is that there's just a wake-up of the soul and an attunement to what God is up to. One of my favorite things uh, about going and visiting other churches is especially going to my Mexican friends. So I don't know if you've had a chance to go into Mexico and go to a worship service there with our Mexican friends, but our Mexican brothers and sisters. But when they get together on a Sunday morning, the service is not the beginning. They get together at least an hour, if not two hours before the service, and they get into one of the side rooms of the church, and it's packed. And everybody that's basically going to the service is already there at, sir, at the, the prayer meeting beforehand, and they pray. And they pray, and they pray, and they pray for the offering, they pray for the building, they pray for the sick people, they pray for the shut-ins, they pray for the service, they pray for the pastor, they pray for the message, they pray for the music, they pray for the, I mean, they pray for everything under the sun. And what I was amazed by those moments is how many times when you get in the spirit of that with people praying, your soul awakens. And when you come into worship, when, you know, we had those worship moments after that, and it just was more alive. It was like your, your soul was woken up from its slumber and your soul was in the room. And when you worshiped, you knew you encountered God and you worshiped. And so maybe a way to up your game is to choose a prayer partner and get together to pray. And it could be, of course, Sunday morning. We always have some time. Uh, the church is open and, and ability to pray. Or it could be other times as well throughout the week. But to get together and for the sole purpose of praying with another Christian. Loving the Lord God, your God with your mind. How do you up your game in that? Now, when you think of mind, it's exactly what you would think of, right? As far as giving your, your, your reason, your, your intellect, your kind of direction of your life with your mind. <coughs> Excuse me. And one of, the, of course, the best ways to change your mind and have it transformed is to just immerse yourself in Scripture. But I want to challenge you, if you've never done this, to up your game a little bit. And here's what I mean by that, is that a lot of times when we read Scripture, we stop at this idea. It's almost like a vending machine, right? Where we have all the needs going on in our life and it's just crazy. And so we go and we're putting it in the quarter and, you know, pressing some button and the thing pops out and we go on with our life and, you know, that's our learning for the day. And it's very kind of uh, the idea of like, I need something from God, come and fill me up, right? And of course, God loves to do that. God loves to fill us up. And it's not inherently evil or anything like that to do that. If wherever you are in your walk is perfectly fine. But if you've never tried this, try it. Try coming to Scripture instead of saying, what can I get out of this to help me with my day? 
is if you just come and say, God, open my eyes and show me the story. And instead of inserting yourself into every single piece of Scripture, let the Scripture talk for itself. A great example of that is, um, that I've always seen was, and I know I mentioned this before, but it's, it's so good to talk about it again, is Jeremiah chapter 29, 11. You guys have heard this, right? For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to do good, right? And, and I love that verse. You love that verse. Everyone loves that verse. And in fact, every time someone graduates from, uh, you know, high school or college, you get those little, you know, cards that say that. You get the little bracelets that say that. You get all the things. And the message kind of that we always hear from that is like, I know God has plans for like specifically me right now, plans to prosper me. And then, of course, you go off to college or whatever, and you don't get in your fraternity sorority of your choice. And, you know, all of a sudden you don't get the grades you need to do the career that you wanted. And all of a sudden you got to do, do some fallback career or, you know, things go wrong in your life. You get diagnosed or something with sickness and you wonder, God, I thought you had plans to prosper me, right? I thought I was supposed to not have harm. And there's kind of that point of view that kind of comes into war with those moments. And, of course, that's what kind of happens sometimes when we read ourselves into the scripture. And, of course, God has plans to prosper us, and that's the grand story. But specifically, Jeremiah 29, 11 was written. And when you just come at it from understanding God's point of the story, saying, God, show me the story. Don't, don't let me insert myself into this too early. You remember that that is written to people exiled in Babylon. People who have lost their families, that have lost their homes, that have lost their jobs, have been enslaved pretty much, living in a foreign land with figurative, that is, chains wrapped around them where they can't worship God openly and freely as they want, that can't do all the things that they're called to do and constantly have to make decision after decision and hard choice after hard choice in trying to find God. And God speaks to them and says, oh, I'm bringing you back. I have plans to prosper you. And know the plans I have for you. And of course, when you read it that way, you also realize that when you apply it to your own life in that point, that God's going to be with you through that thick and through that thin. And so when you don't get in the career choice of, that you wanted, and when you don't get into the things that you wanted, or you get the bad news from the doctor, that verse is still valid and still speaking to you. Where before you might have questioned if it was ever true at all. Loving your God with your strength. Now, of course, this is one of those things that just, it, you can't really define it or separate it out again, but we're going to try to in this moment. And the best uh, maybe way I can kind of put strength and the idea of strength into today's terms is your energy. In other words, where does your energy go? And when I think about my energy, at the end of the day, it's gone. It was gone three hours beforehand, right? And, and I'm trying to, you're trying to get the kids to bed, and we're like, kids, just please brush your teeth. You know, like, kids, just please go to sleep. And they're jumping on the bed, you know, all that stuff. And, and you're just like, dear Lord, please. There's one little hour of sleep, that's all I want, right? So maybe at a different point in life, maybe you get to bed, and you're like, oh, it was a great day. I didn't, I didn't feel any stress at all. But for a lot of us, I know, we get to the end of the day, and it's like our energy is just gone, and our strength, that is, is sapped. One of the things we have to be careful of is that we don't just bring God the leftovers, and unfortunately, probably the best times I have it with God are at nighttime when the house is quiet. So I'm normally bringing God the very tidbits of the leftovers from the day. But yet God wants more than that, right? And so one of the challenges, of course, is to bring God the times of your day that actually you still have energy. That you're not just coming to God always ragged and worn, but that you're able to come to God and make room, that is, with the discipline. To come to God and actually bring some of that strength and that energy and that focus that you could have because that will bleed into the other parts of your life. Now, maybe you do all these things, but I have a feeling that some of us always fall short, and that's okay. But of course, as we mentioned before, the pursuit of a Christian is holiness. And God is here today. He wants us to take that step. And so maybe those are just some ideas, or maybe you have your own that God's put upon your heart. But to take this as an opportunity, to take that next step, and to say to God, you know what? Lord, I'm going to come. I'm going to surrender a little more. I'm going to be more yours this year than I was the year before. Let us pray. Lord, as we're here today, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you so much for being your people. We thank you so much for a scripture that reminds us how good you are. We thank you for constantly working in our life, doing amazing things. 
We thank you for this church, for the people that we think of that are sitting here, those that are home or traveling, for the many hearts and minds that have touched ours. And as we come here today, Lord, we once again want to up our game. We want to improve. And we know, Lord, that when it comes to spiritual things, that's really not up to us as much as it is your spirit, but it's up to us to make room and have room for your spirit to work in us. And so, God, we do want to love you more with our heart. We want to love you more with our soul. We want to love you more with our strength, and we want to love you more with our mind. Help us to do that ever more so this year than we have before. Amen.